I went through these old report cards and I was stunned to see all these teachers writing, Derek is a very funny boy, but there's a time and a place for comedy and the classroom is not the place. Next year, Derek has a very good sense of humor, but if he would focus more on his education, he would make a much better student. Boom, Derek is always fun, looking for an opportunity to fool around. I wish he would focus more on his math. I mean, year after year, I had these teachers saying the exact same thing. If they only knew uh, that I'm not making a living with that math. <laughs> I think I really found a vehicle in making people laugh. just say I'm an actor. Sometimes entertainer fits, fits the role, but then that eliminates director or producer. So it depends. It depends on, on the audience I'm talking to, because f physical performer, f um, comedian sometimes, um, director other times if I'm directing something. In Europe, I might call myself a clown, because in Europe, there's more of a respect that goes with clowning. Here, when you say clown, you think of the fuzzy-haired um, McDonald's type of clown. There happens to be more of a, a history of the type of stuff I do in Europe. <laughs>
I say I'm a clown in Europe, people get quite excited. That is a prestigious thing. You say you're a clown here? They say, well, you know, my six-year-old's having a birthday party next week. Maybe you could do something for that. West, and out there, I think there was in, in in high school there wasn't a lot of opportunity. What you ended up doing was a lot of mime in class because didn't have time to get the props and stuff. So I started to do mime, and that kind of led to getting jobs in the storefront doing mime or something like that. And that kind of led to developing my clown and studying physical theater which led to more street performing when I was going to school to make some money. And also, I really quite liked the training. Mine. <laughs> I went to a physical theater school and studied it, both here in Toronto and in Paris. I guess you always study something that, that you feel um, are your strengths. And I also used to street perform. You learn a lot on the street. On the street, as much as it's sometimes looked upon as not uh, such an advanced art, it's a great pl training ground. It was back in 1980 it, at uh, Young and Dundas when there wasn't a lot of people street performing. And so you had to be big and bold enough to at least grab their attention. And once you've got their attention, to then make them stay, because normally they're on their way to go someplace. And then once they stay, to make sure that what you do is is interesting enough that they stay till the end in hopes that you, you can pass a hat. They got under the yellow slower for the slower person right here. Watch closely, sir. Empty hand, watch closely, sir. Empty hand. I close, watch closely, sir. I close it, watch closely, sir. Empty hand, watch closely, sir. Empty hand, watch closely, sir. Empty hand, watch closely, sir. Close it, watch closely, sir. Empty hand, watch closely, sir. I did a variety of things. I mean, I did a lot of, of not doing things. My, my, uh, trick in a sense was to not do things and keep them expecting that I was going to do something and in not doing it being I would find often more entertaining than what the thing was the thing being maybe juggling or magic or stuff that they may have seen a lot before but it was it was what I did on the process to get there I'm not a real act. I'm just filler. They're doing stuff up there. No, they just said fill. Just filler. <laughs> they wouldn't let me on the main act. <laughs> My father donated a lot of money to the museum to open it, so. <laughs> See, they're filming stuff up there, so if you could clap a lot, and then they'll look like it's me. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, shut up. <laughs> no, no. I, I show you this part. <laughs> How much time do I have left? <laughs> okay, shut up. Watch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Could you just do that cheering part again? <laughs> Okay. 
So if you're a big agent or something, I'm not the main show. <laughs> but I'd sure like to be an agent. <laughs> done it yet. <laughs> How much time do I... <laughs> it doesn't really matter because they already paid me. <laughs> Often the not doing was playing off the audience. So I would be going to do something and someone would do something and I would say, did you guys just, did you just get here? Did, did, did you? And I would show them what I did a moment ago. This, this is how it started. And the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Hang on, for the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Mounted police. <laughs> oh, shut up. Fuck. <laughs> okay. The Royal Canadian Mount. Oh, are you guys just getting here? <laughs> they liked it. <laughs> okay. I think I get a lot of inspiration just from the response when you're a comedian. It's very gratifying, it's very instant. You know, it's not like uh, maybe a painter who has to spend months before he finishes a piece. As soon as you do whatever, the response is immediate. I'm gonna end off with the toughest trick I know. Uh, what? Uh, in, uh, in English, one box rests here. I do a full pirouette, trapping the box when I return in between the two other boxes. Thank you. <laughs> Someone's getting this. <laughs> the art is not to get the response. It's, it's how to build it, and it's how to build your time on stage, and it's how to build the whole time. And often I get in conflict as a director with comedians who want to go get the instant gratification constantly, and the rhythm of what they're doing doesn't work. You, there's a whole rhythm to the piece. And so you might sacrifice something here to build up something there. Juggle and eat the apple. <laughs> and now I eat the apple. <laughs>
spend a lot of time with rhythm. Um, and the rhythm of a piece is, is very important, how it's built. I used to come here a lot as a kid. I have a lot of personal memories here. And I have a lot of firsts here. It was the first time, for example, I shaved. First time I had stitches, which came right after I shaved. And it was the first time I fell in love. And the second time I fell in love was right here in Quebec City. The third time, actually there's about 19 times I fell in love, in here, but that's another story. And it was here I had my first big break. It was 1984, Festival de Tay, right here. It seems like yesterday. I remember the crowd cheering. <laughs> I was hired there just as a clown, just to animate. And, and what happened was I was put in spots that weren't so good. And I said to the producer, listen, can I do these spots? And these spots ended up being very good spots for me. One was in front of a stage called the Pigeonier, which I ended up performing every night. And every night over summer, with a lot of people going to see a lot of different types of shows, you end up being seen by a lot of people and you kind of become part of the fabric of that summer. I did Just for Laughs in 1986, when it was still a very young festival. Uh, performed in both the French and the English galas, which there weren't very many people doing back then. Um, out of that, got a big tour in France with a very famous French comedian, Michel Leb, played the Olympia in Paris, which is the place Jacques Brel and Edith Piaf and, and the Rolling Stones. And for me, it was one of the um, great thrills to see my name in lights. I got hired by the Stratford Festival in 1987 by Robin Phillips, who I think is one of the greatest uh, Shakespearean directors in the world today. And I auditioned for Robin and did quite a bad audition. I, I'm not seasoned as not uh, a person who does auditions. And Robin hired me. There's the Stratford picture. Talking about. There's Robin Phillips. I said, why? I said, there's millions of actors who would, who have much more training in text and than I do. And I said to him, why do you, why do you want me? And he said, uh, most don't know how to use their body. My training is, is physical in, to use my body. And he did some work with me in which he wanted to see if I can move my body. And that's probably the thing I'm most comfortable with. Would you, would you mind if I... Could... One of the things about, about clowning is when it's done right, the, the, be it, be it um, the, the wonderful rodeo clowns or figure skating clowns or whatever, they always have to be able to do it right first. Excuse me. Just one. Just one. Can I? Excuse me. I'm... <laughs> Get out of here. Uh, hi. Uh, excuse me. Do you hear a street buzz? No. Get out of here. Uh, uh, hey. Hey. Uh, that's Derek Scott reporting to When I did the, the skating thing, people really thought I couldn't skate, but it's only because I can skate that I can tilt myself off on those angles in control. That's the difference between someone who really can't do something and is saying he's clowning around and someone who's a clown who really can do it but chooses to do it in a certain way in control. And I don't consider myself so exceptional. I just happened to make a, a study of it. I made a, a profession of it. It wasn't just a fun thing. It's actually a craft and an art and a profession. As a result, I have succeeded in whatever success is I'm making a living at it. Je m'appelle Derek Scott. 
A lot comes from, from working. I think when you're thrown into a situation where you have to create, and I've been very fortunate to have been thrown into a lot of situations. There's a lot of people, David Shiner's one, he's a clown, who's worked on Broadway, and, and there's a lot of people who, who uh, have started on the streets that people may not have known or had some training on the streets, and that certainly has helped me a lot. As long as you go into places where you're vulnerable, you go and venture into acting that you might not be experienced at, you're never going to be good. In Europe especially, there's people who have acts, and it might be an eight minute act, and you can make a lot of money and make a living doing your act, or doing a show. Uh, even some stand-up comedians do the same routines. I think it's, that's when it becomes a trade and not an art anymore. Um, the day that I, I really get so comfortable as to not want to, not be inspired to, to create, I think is the day that I stop being an artist, which is okay, and I start to become a craftsperson, in which I'm making the same product all the time. <laughs> The baby is something I did in Spain with a group that did these babies, and they invited me to do it with them. It's just fun. It's just a silly thing. It's it's something that the the public relate to if you do, can do it correctly. I, I didn't. I did it okay. I would want to work on it more before I did it much more.
Costumes and props only complement. Ellen Cherry. Well, you're trying to sell me a Pierre Cardin, it's an Ellen Cherry. If I think of a costume for a character I'm doing, it's first the character, and it's all the work of the character and the physicalness and the development of the yeah. character and the humor of the character. Yeah. And yes, of course, I have to get him a jacket and get him, which will frame it, frame it badly or frame it better. You know what I mean? Same with props, it will frame it badly or, or better. But I don't spend terrible much amount of time doing that stuff. I'm a designer myself and I say it's, it's a nice suit. Yeah. And a good quality, yellow sherry suit, I'll get on to tell you. It's like a Cadillac. And what size is this, 38? It's a 38. This is a 38, yeah. Now you don't take more than a 38. Uh, it's a little tight, but... No, you don't. You're a pretty big guy. Well, I know I can get the deal for you, you know what I mean? I could fly away <laughs> with these. Okay, you know, I just kind of need to uh, get to know you guys a little better, you know what I mean? And so, uh, now I can, uh, I want to do a deal or something, you know? Okay, stop. No, 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 I do stop. You gotta stop. I, I do. <laughs> when I do stop, you gotta s stop. <laughs> okay. Oh, everybody clap real loud again for the magic guy. Real loud. Real loud. Real loud. Stop. When I do stop, you gotta stop. <laughs> when I was getting into the arts, I would uh, be involved in something, and then I would take time off and I'd go travel. And often people would say, well, that's not good for your career because your career is, is doing well. And I would say, yeah, but as an artist, I have to also grow as a human, otherwise I have nothing to express. I might be learning my craft or I might be getting the business opportunities for my art, but if I haven't worked on myself as a person, then I have nothing to express. Austria is a wonderful country. I was there originally in 1988 for a World Expo. I ended up creating an international comedy festival in Brisbane, Australia, that I ran for three years, and was the producer and raised the money and brought the acts, and, and it was a great amount of joy. On the first year we made the festival, it was the first festival in Brisbane, new festival, in 27 years. And we really broke some new ground just by creating a festival. And uh, so uh, a company documented the event and came up with a documentary one-hour special called Telling Me Banana. That one was aired, got, got uh, record ratings. They were uh, very impressed. It got higher ratings than the whatever is the bathing suit competition that they have up in Queensland, Australia, which is the big event. And it was, for me, just a, just a gift after all the work that I had done to create it and that the results would, uh, would work so well. I do feel that it's very important on a sociological level um, that people don't have a, a, as much contact anymore. You don't have contact with the bank people, you, you now go to big shopping centers. I think it's very important for every human to, every person, to have a community. Hey, we can certainly meet my people from the uh, BJ's. These people... Uh, I tease them all the time, and they invited me to their wedding. I was the only white guy there. Um, they made me a turban and everything. I think JJ's in. Hey, JJ. BJ. This is BJ. He owns the place. This is BJ, a very good friend of mine. Mr. BJ, he owns the place. And a lovely establishment it is. We got a building permit. They're going to be building here as well, aren't they? Thank you very much. I went to his brother's wedding. His fine wife. Lovely lady. Isn't she nice? Always working hard.
Matter of fact, he doesn't work very hard. She does all the work. <laughs> JJ got married. Uh, he, it was an arranged marriage. He met his wife for an hour in a room. And they have a lovely child now. Two children. An hour. Perhaps uh, you should take the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'd have more success. Try to settle, uh, yeah. In your life. yeah, well, I'm doing my best, OK? <laughs> I'm waiting for things not to work out, because I've had my eye on that. <laughs> One of the reasons you're, I'm comfortable being alone is because I get a lot of instant gratification from my public. And you can have thousands of people laughing and, and uh, confirming you, or at least your art. Um, and so often you need the time to be by yourself. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's like too much sugar.
parents were always supportive right from the beginning and um, that support continued certainly now that it's more successful but even when all those years I was struggling and living in tiny little places and not making much money and they were always very supportive it's very helpful Grandma! <laughs> My grandma! <laughs> grandma. Right. Wave to the camera. Did you tell them how old I was? No, I didn't tell them how old you were. Oh, no. good. Okay. Good. Do you want me to tell them how old you are? Oh, sure. That's yeah, she's 26. Oh. She's so vibrant and has such a, a lightness to her that, I mean, she's 84 and she works, she volunteers at an old folks home. <laughs> you know? Uh, she walks around, she has a dog, she just absolutely adores. She, she's a real inspiration to many. Hey, everyone's staring at us. I think we're dating. Yeah, well, we might, they might think, like think we're on our, on our honeymoon. You think so? Well, you know, nowadays, Derek, older women marry younger men, or younger men marry older women. Yeah. That's the style now. Because you know how it is nowadays. You know, I meet some of the people. I think they're married. Gee, she's old enough to be his mother, or he's old enough to be her father. Our grandmother. Yeah. I'm noticing as I get older, I become more selective. You know, that the the friends that you really cherish, you, you spend more time with. And for me, friendships or relationships is about sacrifice. The want to sacrifice your time from other things to dedicate time to these friendships. Pierre, for example, which we met in, in Quebec, is a man I met many, many, many years ago. He uh, has passion for bicycles and he has passion for his work. When are you gonna write the book? There must the book? be a book in here. Yes, the book is there. Yeah. It's called Museo Velo. What? I have already 200 pages, but it's not ready. I, I give me five more years to write it. Yeah. How you know, about the bicycle? Great, <laughs> So, I had any naps recently? If you would have asked me five or ten years ago what I would be doing in five or ten years, I never in my wildest dreams would have imagined that I would be doing some of the things that I'm doing. Oh, no, 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 not the magic stick, huh? No, no, it's been younger. No, 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 it's not, no, what's my... Wow. I don't know. I never know, and, and I'm glad I don't know. I, um, because if I start to envision it too much, I might miss opportunities that are going past. And so I had to realize that I have to not project where I want to be, that I have to be guided as to, to what is out there or what is opportunity for me. People desire human contact, and TV doesn't do it. Uh, theater does it, but often with a fourth wall. Um, 
you know, this is, is real human contact. And I think that's still what we desire. You know, we really still need human contact. And that's what the clown does. The clown doesn't have, um, he doesn't have all these social, politically correct things that we're supposed to have. A clown responds like a child. And there's something refreshing about seeing the world through the eyes of a child. If a clown sees someone tall, they say, boy, you're tall. You know, they don't think, oh, I shouldn't, you know, talk about tall people and stuff like that. So I think that's, it's honest, it's real, it's contact, it's human. It's some of the things that, unfortunately, a lot of entertainment goes away from. It becomes very impersonal, very politically correct. And, and I think the clown does what sometimes we would just like to do. If I can make people laugh, it's, it's just so rewarding to have a vehicle that allows someone to go into that part of them that they often very much need to go into. I mean, that you happen to have a key to that, it's just a key for you. My joy comes from, from what they have. They give back to me. Accommodations provided by the Comfort Inn at 75 Heart Drive. Phone 705-722-3600.